Good morning. And welcome to the Electronics third quarter fiscal 2021 results. Participants in place on a listen only mode, and the floor will be open for your questions following the presentation. It is now my pleasure to host, Rob Cherry, Vice President of Investor Relations. Sir, the floor is Thank you, Operator. Good morning, and welcome to Metho Electronics Fiscal 2021 Third Quarter Earnings Conference Call. For this call, we have prepared a presentation entitled Fiscal 2021 Third Quarter Financial Results, which can be viewed on the webcast of this call or found at metho.com on the investors page. This conference call contains certain forward-looking statements, which reflect management's expectations regarding future events and operating performance and speak only as of the date hereof. These forward-looking statements are subject to the safe harbor protection provided under the securities laws. Method undertakes no duty to update any forward-looking statement to conform the statement to actual results or changes in Method's expectations on a quarterly basis or otherwise. The forward-looking statements in this conference call involve a number of risks and uncertainties the factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from our expectations are detailed in Methods filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, such as our 10-K and 10-Q reports. At this time, I'd like to turn the call over to Mr. Don Duda, President and Chief Executive Officer. Thank you, Rob, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for a fiscal 2021 third quarter earnings conference call. I'm joined today by Ron Zumas, our Chief Financial Officer. Both Ron and I will have opening comments and then we will take your questions. Let's begin with the business highlights on slide four. Our sales for the quarter were 295 million. As noted in our release this morning, the company's accounting period for this quarter included 13 weeks as compared to 14 weeks for the third quarter of fiscal 2020. Our discussions of year-over-year -year comparative results should be viewed in this context. For illustration, our sales on a weekly run rate basis and excluding favorable currency translation were up 8% from the prior year. We share this to give investors insight in how we view the underlying strength of our business, which clearly improved year-over-year. -year. While the top line was strong, we did have some headwinds to gross margin in the quarter. Supply chain disruptions led to additional costs such as premium freight, as well as to factory inefficiencies. Moving forward, these challenges will linger and be joined by demand disruptions caused by the ongoing semiconductor and potentially other material shortages, some of which are related to the recent extreme weather events in the US. This is driving a level of near-term uncertainty that can be seen in our wide guidance range for the fourth quarter. However, None of these issues are systemic, and we expect most to be resolved by the middle of this calendar year. Our confidence in the situation improving is evidenced by our decision to give an early indication of our anticipated sales for fiscal 2022 of over 10% organic growth. In addition, as the commercial vehicle market continues to rebound, our sales mix is expected to further improve gross margin. Turning to our automotive business, we continue to see strength in demand. Our sales in EV grew, and we had a strong awards for power, lighting, and user interface programs in the quarter. Focusing on EV, last quarter we reported that sales into EV applications were over 9% of consolidated sales and were expected to be in the high single digits for fiscal 2021. This quarter, EV sales were over 12% of consolidated sales, and we now expect that number to be over 10% for fiscal 2021. Furthermore, our healthy pipeline of EB programs now gives us visibility to project that this percentage will be in the mid-teens in fiscal 2022. Methods combination of user interface, LED lighting, and power distribution solutions is a winning formula in EB and positions us well for continued growth in this exciting market. Regarding our balance sheet, we generated over $80 million in free cash flow and significantly reduced our net debt in the quarter. The debt reduction was driven by the full repayment of our $100 million revolver draw from March of last year. We continue to have ample liquidity 
and our net leverage ratio is now near zero. The strength and flexibility of our balance sheet allows us to consider the multiple paths to invest in the business in order to drive growth and ultimately shareholder return. In addition to the COVID-19 pandemic, we faced a growing impact from a semiconductor shortage in the quarter. While the COVID-19 situation is improving, the ongoing operating issues from it remain. In regard to the chip shortage situation, the impact to methods in the third quarter was minimal. However, we do anticipate a financial impact in our fourth quarter and beyond as a result of the aforementioned issues, as well as other potential supply chain disruptions. Moving to slide five, Method had its best quarter of this fiscal year for booked awards. These awards continue to capitalize on key market trends like vehicle electrification, LED lighting and auto, and sensors and e-bikes. The awards identified here represent a cross-section of the business wins in the quarter and represent over $50 million in annual business. In vehicle electrification, we won awards for bus bar, power distribution, and user interface programs. We continue to win programs with OEMs globally in auto, commercial truck, and even charging station applications. In non-EV LED lighting, we were awarded programs for several auto applications. We also continue to participate in the growth of e-bikes, which utilizes our proprietary magnetoelastic technology. Lastly, we won two sizable awards for user interface programs with international automotive OEMs. For the first three quarters of the fiscal year, Method has booked awards of over 150 million in potential annual sales. We continue to build on our foundation for organic growth. Regarding the anticipated roll-off of our largest auto program, while we can't comment on our customers' timing, we are pleased that our strong new program bookings over the last several quarters have put us on a track in aggregate to replace the sales from that program. We are also pleased to project that our sales from any single customer is expected to drop below 25% from a high of approximately 50% 50 four years ago all while we continue to grow our top line. We are definitely making progress on reducing both customer and program concentration. Turning to slide six, I would like to elaborate further on our footprint in EVs. As I have shared with you before, Method has become uniquely qualified three-pronged solution provider for EVs. Those solutions include user interface, LED lighting, and power distribution. The architecture of EV is generally divided into two parts, the top hat and the skateboard. The top hat is essentially the body of the vehicle and varies from model to model. The skateboard is a chassis or framework of the vehicle. As many of you know, this type of vehicle architecture is a game changer with EVs as it can be standardized and leveraged across multiple models and platforms. On the top hat, Method offers its traditional vehicle solutions of user interface and LED lighting along with some EV-specific solutions, such as charging ports. These charging ports are fairly complex and include features such as actuators and lighting, in addition to the power connection itself. On slide seven, we show a skateboard. This is where Method leverages its unique combination of auto-grade manufacturing operations, our auto pedigree, and power distribution expertise to supply various bus bars, connectors, and battery disconnect units to the EV OEMs. We are also gaining traction with sensor solutions for biowire systems and battery monitoring. However, it is in the power distribution where the largest content growth opportunity lies. Historically, our participation with power products on internal combustion vehicles was minimal. In EVs, it is quickly growing as, and has reached approximately half of our product sales for EV applications. Consequently, Method has a clear opportunity to incrementally grow our content per vehicle with the transition to EVs. The additional content in EV could range from 20% to over 100% of our current content on an internal combustion vehicle. As I have said in the past, EV is a definite organic growth tailwind for Method. To conclude, given the recent supply chain challenges and the ongoing pandemic situation, 
I am extremely pleased that our strategy and our team were able to deliver at the high end of our previous guidance, generate significant free cash flow, and win substantial new program awards in the quarter. At this point, I'll turn the call over to Ron, who will provide more detail on our third quarter financial results. Ron? Thank you, Don, and good morning, everyone. Please turn to slide nine. Please note that the third quarter of fiscal year 21 contains 13 work weeks, whereas the third quarter of fiscal year 20 had 14 work weeks. Third quarter sales were $295.3 million in fiscal year 21, compared to $285.9 million in fiscal year 20, an increase of $9.4 million or 3.3%. The year-over-year -year quarterly comparisons included a favorable foreign currency impact on sales of $9.7 million in the current quarter. On a weekly runway basis, and excluding the foreign currency impact, net sales were up a solid 7.6% compared to the same quarter of fiscal year 20. The increase was due in part to higher sales of electric and hybrid vehicle solutions. Third quarter net income decreased 9.3 million to 31.9 million, or 83 cents per diluted share, from 41.2 million, or $1.09 per diluted share in the same period last year. In addition to one week less of production activity in the current fiscal quarter, the decrease was primarily due to premium freight and factory inefficiencies resulted from supply chain disruptions due to COVID-19, and to a lesser extent, increased tariff expense and product sales mix. Also contributing to the decline was lower other income of 2.5 million and higher income tax expense of 1.8 million. Please turn to slide 10. Third quarter gross margins were lower in fiscal year 21 as compared to fiscal year 20, mainly due to premium freight and factory inefficiencies resulted from supply chain disruptions due to COVID-19 and the mentioned tariff expense and product sales mix. Fiscal year 21 third quarter margins were 24.6% as compared to 27.7% in the third quarter of fiscal year 20. The premium freight and other expenses resulting from inefficiencies in the supply chain that were experienced in the third quarter are expected to continue in the fourth quarter. However, we do not believe these issues are systemic and based on our knowledge at this time, will gradually be resolved in the fourth quarter with lesser impact to the first quarter of fiscal year 22. Third quarter selling and administrative expenses as a percentage of sales decreased 50 basis points year over year to 11% compared to 11.5% in the fiscal year 23rd quarter. The fiscal year 21 third quarter percentage was attributable to lower compensation expense, lower travel expense and restructuring costs, partially offset by higher stock-based compensation expense. The decrease in compensation expense was primarily related to the benefit of restructuring actions taken in the first quarter of fiscal year 21. While we anticipate an increase in the SG&A percentage on a go-forward basis due to a full year of LTIP amortization on the restricted stock units and more normal travel expense, we expect a future SG&A expense percentage to be more in line with our historical norms, which should still yield an efficient flow through from gross margin to operating income. Regarding our restructuring activities, the third quarter expense was 700,000, and the year-to-date third quarter expense was 8.3 million. The company currently expects an additional restructuring expense of 200,000 in the remainder of the fiscal year, resulting from the previous quarter's actions. The vast majority of the restructuring took place in the first half of the fiscal year. Please turn to slide 11. In addition to the gross margin and sg and items mentioned above, two other non-operational items significantly impacted net income in the third quarter of fiscal year 21 as compared to the comparable quarter last fiscal year. First, other income net was lowered by 2.5 million, mainly due to lower government assistance between the comparable quarters. Second, 
income tax expense in the third quarter of fiscal year 21 was $4.6 million, or 12.6%, as compared to a tax expense of $2.8 million, or an effective tax rate of 6.4% in the third quarter of fiscal year 20. The 12.6% effective tax rate for the quarter was less than the estimated tax rate due to the benefits of some tax planning enacted in the third quarter, which was retroactively applied to the first quarter of the current fiscal year. We expect to benefit from the third quarter tax planning in the current fourth quarter, which will result in an estimated fourth quarter effective tax rate of 15%, down from the previously guided rate of 17%. Shifting to EBITDA, a non-GAAP financial measure, fiscal year 21 third quarter EBITDA was 51.3 million versus 58.7 million in the same period last year. EBITDA was negatively impacted by the higher costs I previously noted. Please turn to slide 12. We reduced gross debt by 103 million in the third quarter, resulting from the full repayment of the 100 million precautionary draw we initiated in March 2020. Since our acquisition of Graycon in September 2018, we have reduced gross debt by $113 million. Net debt, a non-GAAP financial measure, decreased by $108.9 million in the third quarter of the fiscal year 21, as compared to the fiscal year 20 year end, from $134.8 million to $25.9 million. We ended the quarter with $218.17 million in cash. Our debt to trailing 12 month EBITDA ratio, which is used for our bank covenants, is approximately 1.3. Our net debt to trailing 12 months EBITDA ratio was 0.1. Please turn to slide 13. Free cash flow, a non GAAP financial measure, which effective in fiscal year 25 is defined as cash provided from operating activities minus CapEx. For the fiscal year 21 third quarter, free cash flow was 82.8 million as compared to 6.7 million in the third quarter of fiscal 20. The strong free cash flow performance was driven by an approximately $40 million favorable change in working capital in the quarter. While this level of working capital execution is not likely to be sustainable, especially as we navigate through supply chain challenges, we anticipate continuing our history of consistently generating predictable cash flows, which will allow for ample funding of future organic growth, inorganic growth, and return of capital to the shareholders. In the third quarter of fiscal year 21, we invested approximately 4.9 million in CapEx as compared to 8.1 million in the third quarter of fiscal year 20. The lower third quarter CapEx was simply due to timing as opposed to any conscious effort to cur curtail CapEx. We approved CapEx during the quarter that was not reflected in the cash flow statement as the actual outlay for these approved expenditures will occur in future reporting periods. We have a strong balance sheet and will continue utilizing it by continued investment in our businesses to grow them organically in the future. In addition, we continue to actively pursue opportunities for inorganic growth. Please turn to slide 14. As Don mentioned in his, in his remarks, we are providing revenue and earnings per share guidance for the fourth quarter, which is subject to disruption at any time due to a variety of factors, including direct and indirect impacts from the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic situation, the semiconductor supply shortage, and potential challenges from supply disruption resulting from the severe weather experienced in the U.S. in mid-February. The revenue range for the fourth quarter is between 270 and 300 million. Diluted earnings per share range is between 60 cents and 82 cents. The wide range is due to the uncertainty from the supply chain disruption for semiconductors and other material on both method and its customers. Factors that could result in us moving towards the higher end of the sales rate include higher sales due to lesser dis supply disruption to us and or our customers, which would result in higher demand for our products. Lesser disruption would also minimize the cost of sales impact from premium freight, 
factory inefficiencies, and to a lesser extent, tariffs and other logistic factors such as port congestion. Don, that concludes my comments. Ron, thank you very much. Catherine, we are ready to take questions. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is now open for questions. If you have any questions or comments, please press star 1 on your phone now. We ask that while posing your question, you please pick up your handset if listening on speakerphone to provide optimum sound quality. Please hold a moment while we poll for questions. And your first question is coming from Luke Junk. Your uh, line is live. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Don, wondering for the first question, if we could just talk about your current view of the chip shortage and what your customers are telling you at this point sitting here in early March. And curious within that, if you think you're waiting to trucks and SUVs in the auto business should help to cushion the company to some extent, the margin as we go through this. Let me answer the, the, the last part first. Yeah, the, I don't want to speak for the customers, but we do know that, that across the board customers are reallocating to, to the models that are, are, are selling for them. So um, we do benefit from that, um, you know, but it's, it's very difficult to project um, how that will work out. We said, we said in our third quarter that it was minimal, but we're, we are seeing the effect of it in, in, in our fourth quarter and, and our, our guidance clearly uh, reflects it. So when, when you know, we're being told it'll, it'll mitigate, um, it, it runs the gamut. Um, the, the latest we heard is maybe the, the middle of the year, um, but we've also heard uh, uh, longer um, as well. So it, it, it's very difficult um, from where we sit to, to, to predict that. And, and again, that's why we gave a, a wide uh, guidance range. Okay, understood. Second question I had is, by my count, you show about a dozen or so EV product applications on slide six and seven. Are there a couple, maybe two or three, that you'd highlight as an emerging opportunity for the company beyond uh, what we already know is your strengths in terms of bus bars and LED lighting as two key products, for example? Um, sure. One of the ones we like, I mentioned in my prepared remarks, are the charging ports. They, they've um, they're fairly complicated. Um, there's actuators in them, so there's coils in them, there's, there's connectors, there's Class A surfaces. Um, so we're, uh, we don't have any awards at the moment that I can announce, but that is an area that uh, 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 we, are, we are pursuing. Um, the other area, we say sensors and cameras, um, and we do uh, uh, a side repeater for one of the major EV uh, companies that has a, has a camera in it. But we're also looking at uh, uh, putting cameras on uh, Class 8 uh, uh, trucks as well, um, not so much from an electric standpoint, I guess, but as you go into some of the other vehicles, putting uh, smaller delivery vehicles, putting external cameras on is another area that we are, uh, we are working on. Um, from a skateboard standpoint, um, the battery disconnect unit, um, we have some business with that now. Those are fairly complicated. And then there's a power distribution unit as, as, as well. Those are areas that, those are high dollar um, uh, content um, for, for the vehicles. And, and again, we're uniquely qualified to, to um, produce those. So I think those would be the, the, the key areas. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And then the last question I had is if you could just remind us of your overall commercial vehicle exposure and in industrial, and more importantly, what your outlook for that business is right now based on the increase in order rates that we've seen and as build rates start to recover. Well, we, I mean, we follow um, ACT. Um, and we look at somewhat flat, I, I shouldn't say that, because um, it is increasing in, in our, our, our third and fourth quarter, but we see it um, mid next year um, continuing to go up into, into 23. Um, not sure if I would call that the peak, but, but um, I think that's where ACT has it. Um, we tend to outpace AC, 
T. Um, but we'll just have to see how how strong the recovery recovery is. And I would also point out that some of that is just catching up with demand. Yeah, we 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 think too, you know, that this this trend going forward too will uh, provide opportunity, you know, for margin expansion into the next year. Uh, the whole segment is if we get into more vehicle electrification and the the uptick in uh, commercial vehicles, that's our highest margin uh, segment. So to have more activity there um, should lift all boats, so to speak. So um, that's a that's, that's a good thing we, we, we watch very closely. Great. Thank you for that. I'll uh, go ahead and leave it there. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions or comments, please remember you can press star 1 at any time. Your next question is coming from Ryan Sigdahl. Your line is live. Good morning, guys. Thanks for taking our questions. Good morning, Ryan. Uh, just want to dive in. You mentioned margin expansion next fiscal year, which is helpful uh, directional commentary. I'm just curious, there's a lot of headwind challenges, obviously, this year. Um, but as we, you know, looking back maybe – to fiscal 20, EBITDA margins were, um, you know, close to 20%. I guess, is that a reasonable baseline? You mentioned more content, higher margins. I guess, directionally, is that a good baseline for next year, where you think you can do better than that, or the reasons to think it'll, it'll be worse? Uh, that requires us to get into <laughs> guidance yeah. for next, next year. Um, let me see what, what we can say there. I, We've, we've talked about margin expansion in, into because of the class eights, and, and so if I were to, to look at the industrial margins, um, I would would say we would benefit from that from that increase. Also, we have a, a probably a, a better margin mix in some of the new products. Um, uh, keep in mind those won't launch, uh, uh, you know, Q1 of, of fiscal 22, but the BDUs and the PDUs do carry much, much higher margin. So we'll, I would expect from an industrial standpoint, we would uh, uh, see margin and any of the expansion from that. Um, auto, that's a, that's a tougher one. Um, uh, it really depends on chip shortages and uh, what the, the flow, not the flow through, but the, the what the actual demand is uh, from the consumer. Right now, we're benefiting from from both consumer demand, which has been very good um, for you know trucks and SUVs, but there's also inventory re replenishment. If, if you look at what um, the OEMs have uh, uh, in inventory, they're they're the lowest I think I've seen in, in, in my time in, in, in auto. So we're getting a, a, a double um, kind of a, a double benefit from that. Um, and that'll take quite some time to, to probably, uh, with the shortages, for, for the inventory to get back up to you know, 90 days or 100 days. So that, could, that, could that benefit us throughout our fiscal 22? Yes. I, I just I don't want to sit here and say... Yeah. Um, that for sure. We really need to see what happens with these with these shortages. And I know you've got shortages not just in in, in semiconductors, but and we and we have faced shortages um, really since the beginning of the pan pandemic. Um, for the most part, we've been able to alleviate them, but um, they're uh, they're very real right now, and we're seeing them affect everybody's uh, re results. Ron, I don't know if you yeah, want to I, I just think I, I agree with what Don's saying, and you know, clearly all the headwinds from the shortages in, in that are the top line, and as you can see through the results, they also uh, a double whammy effect in that they affect our operations as well too. So, you know, a lot of what we're looking at next year will depend on you know that being satisfied and getting to a more normal run rate, and then I think we'd probably be in a better position to, to, to fine tune that answer. And the other thing I would say, Ryan, is obviously we're very excited about our position in EVs, um, but we need to see how the programs materialize. Do they stay on track? Are they, um, you know, if, if 
the units are x, uh, is it you know x plus or is it x negative um, in in the end? And and no one has enough history on on, on that to, to say for sure. So we're a little guarded on what those volumes will be. You know, you you get on a you know get on a truck program for for Ford or GM, you you pretty much know. Um, what the volume is going to be. It's, it's much more difficult in, 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 uh, in EV. Now, you, we're going to get some volume because we're on the, on the program, but uh, we'll have to wait and see how that materializes. And then, you know, just on the chip shortage, and maybe I missed it earlier, did you quantify or could you quantify how much that impacted your Q4 guide? And then do you expect that to be resolved this quarter, or do you think that'll linger into this uh, next fiscal year uh, yeah I think it's going to linger into to our, our Q1 of next year um, we have been told that uh, perhaps by the by mid calendar year that it may alleviate itself but we've also had the caution that it, it, it may may go on we, we did not quantify it um, uh, there's a lot of moving uh, uh, pieces in the in the quarter that's why we gave uh, 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 a large range um, but I, I can tell you that um, let's go four or six weeks ago that our our, um, our forecast for the fourth quarter was an, was an excess of 300 million so and which would have been a record quarter so we're, we're clearly being impacted uh, in the fourth quarter not so much the the, the third quarter by chips but we haven't uh, uh, we haven't quantified exactly. Uh, last one for me, you know, I've asked this previously, but a little more directly, maybe you know, your net cash position, uh, almost a net cash at this point, nice debt repayment, but from a capital allocation standpoint, your stock valuation relative to earnings has lagged peers for years. I guess you guys have focused on acquisitions, which have come at a fairly sizable premium to MEI's valuation. Uh, have you reconsidered a, a meaningful share buyback program versus more focused on acquisitions? A very appropriate question. That is something that we are considering. Um, we're we're now going to well, up to over 200 million in, in, mm -hmm. in cash. Um, not likely to to pay down uh, much more more debt. It's very inexpensive debt. There's some debt in Europe we may may, may repay. So now, well, let me back up. We thought it was very very important after doing the Graycon acquisition that we prove to the street that Method has a discipline to achieve its synergies and, more importantly, um, pay down debt. And we've accomplished that. Um, and that, that, for the last, well, since the great kind of acquisition, that was priority one. Now, where we're sitting today, uh, we're, we're ahead of where we thought we would be, uh, largely because our teams did a very good job of, of taking cost out of the factories and, and um, dealing with, with tariffs and so on. So now we will turn our attention to, you know, where do we put that cash to, uh, uh, to, to use? Do we, we do, we do a, a stock buyback? Um, that is, that is that's certainly on our list. I won't, I won't give you a, a priority on it, but it is cer certainly something that we are, we are, are considering. Now, having said that, we will, you know, we always look at acquisitions. Um, Graycon was, was, I think at first, there was some concern about it, but it, it clearly um, uh, has put us in, in, in good stead in the commercial vehicle market and the EV market. And, and some of the, the EV wins we had were on uh, what will be commercial trucks, and particularly when you get into BDUs and PDUs. So um, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, I'll say that we're not going to do an acquisition. Uh, so I'm not going to give you the, the, the order, but I can tell you that, that a stock buyback is, is something that we would certainly consider. Great. Helpful color. Thanks. Good luck, guys. Thank you. There are no further questions from the lines at this time. I would now like to turn the call back to Don for closing remarks. Catherine, thank you very much. And we'll thank everyone uh, for listening uh, uh, to us today. And, uh, have a good, uh, good rest of the day. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This does conclude today's conference call. You may disconnect your phone lines at this time and have a wonderful day. Thank you for your participation.